intro song. They do. They play. It's the same song as when Mario. Oh. From Erie Zone Government Access, Channel 9, from the City Hall Council Chambers, it's time once again for the Taxpayers Hotline Show. And now, ladies and gentlemen, your host... Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is John Steiner. Kaz is running a little bit late today, so uh, I will be taking your calls. And we brought in a special guest today uh, to talk about some of the great things that she does, and that's uh, Ruth Thompson with the Anna Shelter. Thank you. Ruth, how are you today? Good. How are you? Good. So what we'll do is, uh, of course, we'll have the phone lines open. Uh, 870-1284 is the number. Uh, if you have any comments, complaints, or anything you want to talk about, call in. Uh, you know, Ruth and I will talk about uh, what's going on at the Anna Shelter these days. And uh, Kaz might come rolling in here at any second. So it's uh, business as usual today. So hope everybody's having a good Monday. And Ruth, how are you today? I'm really good. Thank you. Good. Well, I mean, unless you've lived under a rock, I think a lot of people know what the Anna Shelter is. But right. for, there's some people that don't. Why don't you give us, like, a, a little background sure. and a little origin and stuff like that? Um, I started the Anna Shelter in 2004, so yeah, it feels like an eternity, but um, getting, closing in on 15 years. Uh, we are a no-kill, open admission animal shelter, so we take in everything from small rodents like gerbils, hamsters, mice, rats, all the way to horses and farm animals. So we do have a farm facility that we can help uh, livestock and farm animals. Our majority population are dogs and cats, so that's uh, pretty much our primary focus, but Essentially, any animal in need um, can come to the shelter, receive the medical care it needs, uh, and then hopefully be placed into a new home or reunited with a home if it's lost. You know, um, a lot, everybody knows that uh, you, know, you guys are located on East 10th. We are. We're really close. We're 15 blocks from State Street. So we uh, we consider ourselves in the heart of Erie, um, Lower East Side, which is where I grew up and um, kind of have my roots. Um, but we also have a lot of presence in the rest of the county. We have our wellness centers, which we're really proud of. We offer uh, low-cost, quality veterinary care to the public animals as well. Um, we're actually opening our fourth clinic. We have one located real close to the shelter on the corner of 10th and Payne. Then we have a facility out in Albion on uh, Route 6N. We have a facility out in Quarry on Route 6. And we're opening our newest location on 26th and Millfair. So kind of a, a good reach all over the county um, for that for that type of care. Uh, you said something about um, hold that thought. Okay. See. Call right back. I thought he said that one right there. Is there someone there? It's lit. No, hit the release. There you Let's go. Let's try that again. Call right back. Is this lit though? Yeah, that's what he said. Press that one, right? I don't know, but doesn't the lit mean there's something going on? No. Okay. Oh, there you go. Nobody's there. Sometimes that. people call and they hang up. Oh, that's not nice. Yeah. But uh, we were talking about, uh, you had mentioned some of the programs that you guys were running. Yeah, we are big into our community. Um, we are very blessed to be supported. Um, we're private, so we don't have any association with any federal or any other type of association with any kind of organization. Let's try this again. Want to try it again? Yeah. Which one should we one. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. It says block, doesn't it? You you are not no. There's a number up there, but there you should be okay. Okay, Ruth. Hi. Rusty says hello. Oh, okay. Does that somebody you adopted from us? Yeah, your awesome. dad got me that little uh, makeshift Yorkie. Oh, I think I do. That's been a long time, hasn't it? Yes, it has, and he's still spoiled. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Spaghetti, steak, everything that's good. For <laughs> I do now. I remember exactly who you are. That's awesome. Thank you for loving him. That's right. that means a lot. Do a good job out there, and Thank the you. public should really back you up. Thank you. Um, Thank Steiner. You. Yes. Where's my buddy Kaz? Kaz is taking his wife to a doctor's appointment today. Okay. I, I know what's going on there, but yeah. uh, I'm inquisitive about the GAF site. Now, they paid $3 million for it. Now, nobody wants to come and build. What's your opinion on that? Uh, actually, I'm a little surprised by that. I think that with that being waterfront property, I think that... Uh, if I was a developer, I'd be all over that site. 
Well, you know, since uh, Mayor Schember has wanted to get alerted now for the whole city, maybe they they will come in because they can get a ten year ride then peel out. We'll see that, and there lies the problem. I remember uh, when uh, uh, the former mayor Filippi did that. A lot of people took advantage of it, and I know there was a company right down on the bayfront uh, yeah. that. Sun. Actually, it's right next to that. It wasn't Sun Sunburst. It was the one next to that. Okay. As soon as their Lerda was being Lerda then bailed. Yeah. As soon as their Lerda was up, they left town and they they leave us holding the bag. I think the Lerda is a good idea. I think we need to do anything we we have to do to uh, encourage economic development, but we need you know to establish different you know uh, criteria for the out clauses as far as. Prior. You know, you can't give alerted to the whole city. I mean, you can give it to the the affected areas, the blighted areas. You got realtors and people who come in and take advantage of that. And who takes it in the end? The taxpayer. Well, at this point, it's a tough call because you know you want uh, a lot of people aren't going to buy properties in the blighted area, unfortunately. Well, that's because of the school system too. Right. I mean, you have so many moving parts as far as. Uh, taxes and crime and no jobs and everything like that. So to put restrictions on that would probably limit the economic development. Whereas if it's throughout the whole city, uh, people might, you know, you want people with disposable income. Oh, well, you'd like them to come in, but you see where all the rebuilding is going on. It's going on up at the mall, Harbor Creek. They're going where the taxes aren't so bad and the school taxes aren't so bad. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that uh, you know, with the with the with the new Lerda Pro, I know they had the tiered structure. I I know he was talking about reinstating the Lerda, but at, at how it was going to be structured, we're not sure yet. But I think it's a good idea. But it needs to be implemented properly because uh, we need new residents and we need people. You know, we need to fill out our tax base with people that have disposable income so they can go out and spend money and just. Re- rejuvenate the economy in the school district. Yeah, what we have downtown is we have Gannon and Erie Insurance, uh, Ham- or PNC Hospital down there, and it's got to be more than that. Well, the thing is with those places, they're they're great. I, you know, they offer the services, they provide jobs, but here's the thing: at 4:30, what's the busiest road in the city of Erie? That's the Bayfront Highway, as everybody gets in their car, leaves work, and drives out to the county where they live. True. Now, you, there's a bunch of different arguments as to, you know, what roles they play. I mean, they do create jobs. They do they do, do the pilot programs. But it's getting to the point where something has to be done where some type of a user tax, I know Kaz was talking about that. Some cities employ it. A lot of them have trouble. You know, they'll fight it. But it's working together. I mean, the nonprofit, the business, the government, all the branches of government need to start working together, including the school district. I think nobody is going to relocate to a city with a failing school district. No, they won't. That, that is the, whenever a family looks around, sure our cost of living is low. And honestly, I hate the fact that we are the snowiest city in the world. I, I, it's, to me, everybody thinks that's a great thing. I, I just don't like the idea. I go back to, the, to 1956. Well, I, you know, I heard that was bad. I remember the 70s was bad too, in the mid 70s. But this year, I mean, us being such so way ahead, you know, every time I see us on the national news, it's either we, we got four, four feet of snow or, you know, we voted for Trump. So I'd like to see us, uh, national news talking about how we have a new mayor, new elected officials making a comeback and starting to build this city from the ground up with everybody working together. And that's the key. We're going to Canton. That's what I, they went, I don't know all the details, but I know they, they do some economic development programs over there or something like We're that. Down to the lower east side, the lower west side. Look at his own city before he goes somewhere else. Take care of what we have and not what somebody else is doing. Well, it's it's good to go other places and get uh, see what they're doing. I mean, why reinvent the wheel if somebody's already had the courage and the heart to try something new? I mean, not everything that they have is for us. I mean, we have a lot of uh, Bayfront residential property on both East and West Bayfront that are developable, 
But, you know, how do these other places do it? What incentives do they run? You know, what programs do they offer? I'll leave you with a word of wisdom. I need one. For the mayor. Alexa, how do I fix my city? <laughs> Have a good day. Take care. Thanks for calling. Call back later if nobody calls. All right. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, John, he calls to regular. Yeah, I remember who he was after he started. He's, he's pretty knowledgeable about stuff. There you go. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hi, John and Ruth. My boys, my ginger cat. Could you, hold on, hold on a sec. Could you do me a favor? It's hard for us, when you're up front, it's hard for me to, like, hear both. You know what I mean? Could just, you? like, could you, like, step out in the hallway and just call back? No, because I'm sitting here. Well, I think there's a, what happens is the phone there's, is a second behind you, so we hear you and then we hear you again. It's like, there's so like, you stay on it, just walk back there. stay so on it, just it'll be easier to hear you better. When people call, you get, we get feedback, you know, that they, we ask them to turn. Sometimes they should turn on the mic, but I'm still on. What'd she say? Hey, is this gonna work now? Yeah, that's good. That's better. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. So I have two ginger cats that I got from you guys five oh, years ago. Oh, thank you. So I have a couple of things I want to talk about. But sure. So, with, um, there was this older cat who was walking around in circles in the, in the intersection a block away. And frankly, I was afraid to touch him because I didn't know if he was rabid or sure. what. Um, and I, um, so I sh- emailed and called and texted a friend who I know cared. And then I, I think I shared on Facebook to the Animal Network, and eventually I found out it was somebody down the block. Okay. Apparently somebody had taken the cat to you guys. Okay. So tell tell us about how can we be most helpful in getting the, the animals that we see reunited? Yeah. Well, not everybody wants to touch or take them home. And sure. Sure. To do that. Yeah, and there can be a safety issue with that too. Um, unfortunately, it depends on how you look at it. Animals in Pennsylvania. Um, down, say it again. Speak slowly. Oh, sure. Um, cats are free roaming in Pennsylvania, so unlike dogs, it's not illegal for my cat to go up on your porch. That's just an unfortunate way that Pennsylvania law is structured for cats. So we tell people, don't give a stray cat a reason to stay. If you offer the cat food, water, let it in the house, cats don't have a lot of loyalty, so it's going to stay wherever, you know, you allow it to stay. So unless the cat is sick or injured, we ask that you don't bring it in. Um, if the cat is sick or injured, we do ask that you bring it to the shelter. I don't have the resources to pick up um, stray animals, but I do if, for example, if you called and said, you know, there's an injured cat on my front porch, I would send one of our staff members out to get it for you. But we do try to rely on the public to help us, you know, bring the animal in. Um, dogs, the city of Erie has a dog catcher. And the uh, county also has a dog catcher. So um, you can utilize their services. I think it's 8 to 4 for both of them um, if you find a stray during the day. Otherwise, our building is staffed from 8 in the morning until 8 at night. And then we have an on-call service. So if you found a sick or injured dog, um, like John and I were talking, the county uh, calls us all the time. State police, we work with, uh, you know, on a daily basis to bring in animals. Um, but cats, unfortunately, are just an epidemic. It's it's sad because there are so many stray cats, and that's one of the reasons we offer the ESNIT program where we spay and neuter um, feral cats or outside cats, and we only charge a $20 copay to help us cover costs. Uh, and then I wrote for a grant to cover the rest of the surgery because sterilization is honestly the only way, you know, for us to combat that population. Cats can get pregnant two weeks after giving birth, so one cat can have over 500 kittens in her lifetime. So unfortunately, it's becoming an epidemic, and people think they're helping by setting up these colonies and feeding these cats, but if you're not sterilizing them, you're only adding to the problem. It was tough. This guy was obviously in distress, and it, and he was, but I didn't, I was afraid to pick him up, and then it was too late for me to, he was gone. Right. I, I like, I walked all over the neighborhood, and. Yeah. Anyway, he, I did meet with his people. He eventually got reunited. Oh, good. The, the postman told me where the cat lived. Good. Anyway, okay, so that, so that's the one issue, and thanks for explaining. Sure. 
This is a theory I'm developing, John. I'm concerned that from at least a 900 block all the way to Sassafras and maybe more, West 12th Street on the north facing side, on the south side of the street, the snow has not melted and most of that sidewalk is inaccessible. Some of it significantly. And um, I think the city should get them to clear their sidewalk. So I was thinking about it. Now that's an area where it's zero lot line, mostly zero lot line. It's also the not parking in most of that area. So maybe the plows are exacerbating the problem. I don't know. But it's, so you have a confluence of several things. You have um, no parking so that they're parking, they're plowing close to the street. You have narrow sidewalks. You have zero lot lines. And so this, and, and, and it's north facing. So the snow's not going anywhere. Well, what I, you know, when you think about 12th Street, as I picture it in my mind, it kind of reminds me of Burton, when you like 38th and Burton, when you come down Burton, where the, you can shovel the snow, and as soon as those plows come by, it's right back on where you just shoveled. But and the thing is, is that uh, when it freezes, you can't shovel it. You would have to, uh, the ice removal... Um, there's certain times, of course it's against the law, yeah, everybody has to have their sidewalk shoveled, but in this day and age, in reality, in the snowiest city in the world, uh, sometimes we have to take it with a grain of salt and we have to work with these business people. Uh, 12th Street is usually a uh, business corridor type of thing, where usually you don't get too, met, too much... Uh, uh, citizen traffic as far as walking and, well, maybe biking. But, uh, you know, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be taken care of, but in some instances you need to show a little bit of leeway to some of these businesses, especially on 12th Street, with that being the industrial corridor. Now, you know, I don't know what every building is over there as far as, you know, if they're industrial, what commercial, whatever. But, uh, you know, we have to be a little lenient with that. And the rules are on the books. You know, like we talked about before, uh, we can tell them, you know, enforce, 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 but do we want people enforcing snow code, snow code, uh, shoveling codes or chasing bad guys and, you know, uh, people robbing, uh, Circle K every week? So I think it's, 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 it's not that it's not important, but as far as the selective enforcement it goes, we have to be, uh, we have to be smart on what we do. Now, I'm not saying that they shouldn't take care of it, but on that corridor on 12th Street, what they do is they get like four plows together and they push it, push it, push it, and then boom, right onto the sidewalk where it goes. So I understand what you're saying. And, you know, at, I mean, especially this year with the way things have gone with the snow, it's kind of hard to, uh, hold people responsible, hold them responsible when there's 50,000 other places that need to be held responsible, too, but I understand, so... Well, the part of my theory is maybe this idea of zero lot line isn't always a good idea in our construction codes. I know the port is proposing to put in some zero lot line construction down at 12th and State. Maybe zero lot line in certain locations proposes more issues to snow management than not. And 12th and State and the Bayfront Connector is specifically where they're proposing to put in zero lot line construction is a, is a heavily used pedestrian area. So that's not a good place to, to do that, in my opinion. I mean, in my personal opinion, uh, the less codes and uh, restrictions, because I know a lot of my friends that are involved in business, they won't come to, to the city to do anything because of codes and other things like that. So the less codes that we put on businesses regarding, you know, fire and this and that and this and that, I mean, I understand that it's needed, but we've pushed a lot of businesses away that I know personally about it, and it concerns me. So and we're going to have to let more callers in. Wait, there's one more thing I want to mention, because you have your guy who calls all the time. That You mentioned the GAS, that they didn't get some takers. Well, my concern with the port 
especially where they want to close in the area under the lower observation deck. They want to get rid of the parking and they want to close that in. And they say they want to put more retail there. That's going to end up being walling all that, that area off and you're just going to have structure there. You won't be able to see a cross anymore. If, if we can't even get a bidder on the gas site, I think the port should just slow down on trying to put more retail, more businesses, more restaurants, more Ferris wheels down the port. Maybe we don't have that much demand. Okay. Um, that's, that's okay. You can, you can react offline. I'll okay. hang up now. All right, thanks. At this point, we need tax revenue, plain and simple. We need... Uh, down there, I think some of the plans that I've seen with the mixed use, they have commercial, residential. Um, I think that it needs to be, you have to have both of those with some public access. I've seen like two or three different architects bring forward different plans. But the thing is, is that is our most taxable property. So we need to have a little bit of everything, it's office space, retail, commercial, restaurants, you know, business, and we need to make it a lively place where people with disposable income come down and spend money. The downtown area is the is the total opposite. We're full of dollar generals, liquor stores. Uh, you can buy a 40 for like $2.50 up the street. I mean, if you walked, I stood it at a friend's business and I was standing outside. It was in the afternoon. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was just looking around. And uh, I'm standing there, and there were business women walking up and down State Street, and these guys were catcalling him and embarrassing her. We don't need that kind of stuff. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. My response to your comment about the income generation in the port and wanting people with disposable income, what you fail to understand is the bayfront, is the backyard, is nature, is the recreation area, is the peaceful area for the people who cannot afford to just get in a car and go to Presque Isle. This is a precious resource which we are potentially throwing away. To, this is a resource that belongs to the people of the city who don't have the options, who don't have the kind of disposable income you're talking about. And we owe it to them to protect that rare and precious resource. Duly noted. Thanks for calling. Ruth. Uh, well, this, I appreciate you calling. Thanks. Um, here's the situation, okay? I've been invited on this show many years, okay? And I just give my opinions on things and try to, give people something to talk about and listen to, and that's it. If you may not agree with my opinions, good. If you don't agree, give me a call. We'll talk about it. But uh, do I know everything? No. Do I claim to know everything? No. Only Ruth does. Ruth <laughs> Ruth knows way more than all of us. So anyways, Ruth, let's talk that's about That's why I'm sitting here quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, that's what you have to deal with, and that's okay. I mean... Sure. Something that she asked, she did ask something, and you said something about you get calls from the state police. We do, yeah. We um, are available to all municipalities, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it seems like they need my help mostly on Saturday nights at like 10.30, and I get to bed real early. So, but yeah, we're available, um, like I said, an animal in need. We don't have hours. I mean, we're How there. are you supposed to go to happy hour if they're calling you all, all hours of the night? I got happy hour. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hey, if they're attacking you, what would they do if I came down? <coughs> I'd love it. <laughs> I, I tell you, that would There's be... plenty of seats out there. Hey, John, how many times have we told you to come on the show? Kaz does it every day. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the whole thing here, people have their opinions, and it's it's a tough situation to be a city councilman, a county council person, the mayor, the executive. It's always going to be something looking at the other side, just like you have Doc come on. He thinks he knows it. He does know it. But other people are going to disagree with him constantly, like they disagree with me. They say, I take up too much time. Well, when you're slow, I 
come on and take up the time. It's like everything else. Just like that lovely lady next to you. She get look how much time she puts in Thank and you. doesn't get paid for it. Thank you. I appreciate that. The hard worker and the whole shop. But well, listen, every, every, you know what you're saying is exactly right. Uh, there's two points that, two views to every point. Uh, there's a point, there's a counterpoint, there's two sides to every story. And, uh, you know, it just seems strange that, uh, you know, people would come down here and, like, try to attack us, attack me sitting here trying to talk about things when I'm doing this on my own time. And, you know, do I know some stuff? Sure I do. Am I involved in politics in Erie? Yeah, I have been. Have I, I've sat on so many, Kaz never told you some of the stuff that I've done, but I've sat on more committees, boards, I've done more things in this community than most. And I never sit here and self-promote myself. I just sit here and talk about issues and what I know and things I hear. And a lot of the times, the stuff you've heard on this show, you end up reading about in the newspaper about three or four days later. Well, I think the newspaper does a great job, but I'll tell you what, ever since I stopped fishing, I, I stopped using the paper. <laughs> well, you got you, well. that's because you don't have to wrap it with anything now, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Ruth, you guys use a lot of newspaper out at the shelter? We do. See, that's then. something you can donate. <laughs> yeah, we ask you to take the shiny parts out. So any of those ads, we can't yeah, use. So. Dry newspaper, that out. old toys, old blankets. Yes. I got a Back seat full of toys I'm going to drop You're off. You're the best. So probably at the store, not at the Yeah, you shelter, know where to find me. Ruth, let's, um, do you have any more questions, John? No, not, uh, not today. Uh, just have a great day. And uh, yeah. people out there, maybe I'll come down with my Mickey Mouse suit on. There, there you go. There you're I want to be here that day. So yeah, that'll know. be entertaining. We've, you know, we've had some people that have dressed up. Oh, yeah. Randy Brewer used to do it all the time, and yeah. he was a real character. Yeah, back in the day, for sure. But well, have a great day. Yeah, if nobody Bye-bye. calls, call back later. <clears throat> the uh, You guys have a website? We do. It's theannashelter.com. So put the word the, T-H-E. Theannashelter.com. Yeah, Anna, like a girl's name. It's her in my shirt. Theannashelter.com. We're real active on Facebook. We have an amazing Facebook presence. It, this technology kills me anyway. Right. But, um, for example, we shared a post recently about a dog that came in as a cruelty case. Um, and it was shared over 800,000 times, which I was just floored. Um, when I looked at 24 hours, I looked at the, you know, they give you a little synopsis of what your Facebook page is doing. And to see that that post had been shared 800,000 times and reaching people of Australia and Germany and, um, Crazy. So we're, we're really blessed, and that's something we were talking about earlier. Um, we're not affiliated with any national or organizations. We literally are a standalone. We're 501c3, um, but totally grassroots. If you know my history and my family background, um, we're all about just working hard and, and the passion. And I think that's one of the reasons that community really has wrapped around us and supported us is because, you know, I joke that, you know, the Anna Shelter is more a lifestyle for me. It's who I am. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to walk away from the shelter. So um, I think the community has seen that and, uh, and again, has, has supported us, and I'm very thankful for that because if it wasn't for that, I don't know how we would be able to do what we do. You earlier mentioned about some of the other locations that you have around the county, Albion mm-hmm. and Cory. How many people do you, how many volunteers do you guys have? We keep 50 on our registry because we do pay for insurance. It's not an easy environment to be in. Um, and then altogether we have 33 staff members um, for the shelter and the wellness centers um, because it's a 24-hour day. So you, you guys know. employ 33 people. We do. Wow, mm-hmm. that, that's really good. Yeah, so that's great. And, and, I mean, they're all, you know, we have veterinarians that work for us. We just got our fifth veterinarian. And talk about difficult to bring somebody into this community. Um, the veterinarians that we've been recruiting are from out of – we just had a veterinary move here from Boulder, Colorado. So it's been pretty cool. She's been here uh, just a year now. Um, the other veterinarian that we have coming in is coming here from Chicago. Right. So um, while we were doing contract negotiations was during our five feet of snow in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And I kept hedging on calling her because I thought, oh, you know, this is really going to deter yeah. her from wanting to come here. Um, but she is not afraid. And she has signed her contract, and she's coming into Erie uh, to be one of our veterinarians. So we're excited about that. Um, 
But yeah, there, there's always so much going on. We talked about our some of our other programs that we offer that I'm really proud of. Uh, we call it Anna Cares. It's an acronym. Um, it's a community outreach uh, program that I started. It's on its sixth year now. And it has grown to now have two employees um, and has seven volunteers in that program. Um, some of the things we were talking about earlier, we visit over 400 senior citizens a month. So we go uh, as far as Corey, Manor, um, all over to the different senior homes where we do pet therapy visits. We're active in um, all the different schools, Erie County and Erie City schools, where we do education programs for children anywhere from first and second grade, and then we do a university program. Really excited. We partnered with Gannon, Barron, and Mercyhurst, um, where we have programs kind of like pet therapy for, you know, your college students that can't take their dogs with them or their cats with them. Um, we hire the only Pets for Vets chapter in this area. There are 21 chapters across the country. We are only one of two. The other uh, shelter chapter is in Texas. So we were approved as a Pets for Vets program um, affiliate. We do a public food bank where we give uh, free pet food to people that need the help to keep their animals home and maybe can't afford food for whatever reason. So we, we try to help the humans as much as the animals. I love people, right. um, you know, not the same as I love animals. I, and I'm, I'm a firm, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I don't so. blame you. No, and, but I, I do. People walk, they don't blame you. You know, <laughs> I do believe, and another reason we always, this has been now the third year with uh, Erie Gibbs, that the shelter has come in number two to the number of donors to Erie City Mission. And I love the mission. And we actually partnered with them this year for some really cool programs. I love what they do for people. And I believe as a Christian, animals are below people. I mean, they're not, should not be treated as humans. And so I love the fact that our community has supported both, you know, us and the city mission because people are just as important, if not more. Um, certainly I like some animals better than I do some people, but, um, yeah, but I, I'm all about helping humans too. I mean, we joke all the time about the two and four legged. Well, you, you know, know that we serve. You never know. Some people, you know, watching the show. Can you donate through your website? Yeah, we have a donate now button on both our website and our pay or on our um, Facebook, and that goes right through PayPal. Um, but you know, if you can't afford to help us out monetarily, there are things we use every day, like bleach, laundry soap, paper towels. I have some extreme couponers who have been bringing stuff in. Amazing what these people can do with that. Um, Blankets, if you have any blankets or towels, they can be more than gently used. I mean, they're going to dogs and cats, so they can be stained. They can, you know, not super ripped up, you know. But uh, there's lots of stuff that you can do to help, even if you just want to come and visit. You know, we love having visitors at the shelter. We're very open, um, you know, we love you having to visit. So if that's something you have time and, you know, that's the resource that you have available to help us, bring it. Uh, you know, like people that donate, you know, donate money, what, you know, what kind of things would you like to spend it on. I mean, what well, do you wish? I mean, what, if you had a wish list, what would uh, you wish for? Um, right now, I'm looking to buy some more kennels. So that's something that's expensive that I'm trying to buy. Um, our number one expense is medical. So we spend uh, an exorbitant amount of money on medication. And, um, you know, right now we have 63 dogs at the shelter and 109 cats. So that's a lot of animals. And being no kill, um, we treat for everything from upper respiratory to you know, parasites, um, we have amputations that we do, we, we do critical care surgeries, we have a critical care area for animals that are in need of that. Um, and now with our cruelty division, that has been unbelievable. Um, we swore Officer Duckett in back in June, and I was just going over some figures with him last week. He has gone on over 600 calls in six months, so he has been so busy, and he's a one-man band. I mean, he is by himself out there. I'm so passionate, so dedicated. I mean, that guy puts in easily 60 hours a week. I mean, he is just in the same thing. He is available to us Saturday, Sunday, whenever we need him or an animal needs him, he is there. So we're really, really blessed to have Officer Duckett on staff, um, you know, taking on that role. So that's another area that I would love to do more. We got a grant um, from the Erie Community Foundation for half of a vehicle because, um, as I was telling you before, it's hard to put these animals in your own cars, and that's what we were doing for a long time. And if you've ever picked up a hit-by-car dog on the side of Interstate 90, um, it can make a big mess in your car. So we were very fortunate to receive um, Erie Community Foundation. We'll do half for a vehicle. So we were excited um, to get that awarded, and um, in October we bought uh, our first-ever vehicle 
So that's been pretty cool to uh, to be able to use that and uh, and allow our staff to use that instead of their own vehicles. How how many animals do you think you guys serve over there a year? Um, our average is about six thousand a year. So that's between, um, like I said, when we started, you know, and I think it was like fifty five my first year because no one knew, you know, when I would say like, hey, I have this animal shelter, you know, people thought I was crazy. But um, it has completely taken on a life of its own. I mean, so much so that. Uh, I've been at meetings in Harrisburg, and I've been in other places where somebody will say, oh, I've heard of you guys, you know, and that that's another thing that always blows my mind is when people have heard of us, so it's pretty cool. You know, there's, you know, obviously there's other agencies that work with animals, too. I mean, how do you guys, what do you think you guys compare with those as far as You know, I numbers? think we all have our own mission. Um, I'd like to think that we all work for the same goal. Um, we all have our own different policies and procedures. We're all set up differently. Um, we play really well with others. Um, that's something I'm really proud of. Yeah, we offer um, a lot of the smaller rescues. Um, we offer them some of the resources. I remember when I first started and I was going around asking for veterinary care, and I was trying to contract with veterinarians, and I, I got like, well, we'll give you 10% off. And I'm like, well, no, I'm going to have a lot more. So I've been able to work with a lot of the smaller rescues. Proud of that. Go ahead, caller. Hey, this is for Ruud. Hi. How was that? How was that uh, pit bull that you brought in? It was abused a few weeks ago. Oh, Grace. Yeah. Yeah. She's actually doing really well. She has gained. Um, I learned a lot about emaciated dogs from her. She's gained. Uh, it's going on nine pounds. So it's a real slow progression to get her back to her normal weight. Um, we were able to press charges last week on the owner. Um, again, Officer Duckett did some amazing investigative work. I was so. So impressed and so proud of him um, as he was able to track down and locate the owner and got enough evidence that charges were pressed. Uh, and I think now there's a continuance through March because he got an attorney because these are felony charges. So, um, But she's doing really well. There was a, a really critical time when we didn't think she was going to make it. I, again, I'm not a veterinarian, so I learned a lot from my veterinarians. But she kind of rallied and seemed to be doing really well. And then some of her frostbite got infected, and because she didn't really have any resources to fight that off, she got, uh, again, critically ill. But she's doing really well. She's able to stand up. She walks around, um, loves attention. I try to keep posting Facebook updates. I, if you don't have a Facebook, I apologize. But Well, actually, no, I'm proud of you if you don't have a Facebook. But um, I'll try to get more updates posted. Uh, sometimes the news media will pick up on little stuff like that. But um, according to Dr. Lyon, who has taken on as her lead veterinarian, he thinks probably March she should be able to be put up for adoption. So. Yeah, I've seen pictures of her on Facebook. She does look like E.T. Doesn't she? She's got the funniest. And, well, especially because she's so thin and she's got this big yeah. head. But she's doing really, really well. And she's such a nice dog. And the more I'm finding out about, you know, why it happened and what happened, it just – it. It just makes me lose so much faith in, in humanity and, and how we treat uh, animals and then how we treat each other. But a really nice dog, great temperament, very sweet. Um, so she'll make somebody a really good pet. That's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Thanks for calling. Okay, once again, I'm John Steiner here with Ruth Thompson from the Anna Shelter. Uh, we were talking about something else when <laughs> before the show started. Yes. And um, I said it was okay if you wanted to ask me a question. Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, Ruth, some of you know that uh, when the uh, shooting went down in Las Vegas, who was who was singing? Who was Jason Aldean. Jason Aldean concert. Uh, Ruth was uh, at the concert, and uh, when the fire and the shootings were taking place, um, you know, I asked her if I could ask her some questions about it and uh, what her thoughts about what happened and maybe get a first-hand account of somebody that's actually been there. Would you be willing to share some of that with us? Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely, you know, something I'll never never forget, never had wanted to experience anything like that. Um, I've gone to that festival every year since it started, and I don't get a lot of time to myself, and I don't, um, you know, so this... I think part of me still is angry because I feel like something that I really loved was taken away from me. So um, so that was always something. It's right around my birthday, and so every year, you know, I'm super psyched to go to it. And I love country music. I'm a big concert. I pretty much go see any live music, but uh, country's my thing. So um went, and uh, it was great. All, all four nights 
were great. Um, but that particular night, um, and unfortunately, growing up on the Lower East Side, I'm very familiar with gunshots and what yeah. that sounds like. Um, so in those first three shots, and now, now that I know so much more about what happened and who was shooting and that kind of stuff, um, but I heard those first three shots, and I have heard people say, like, oh, we thought it was fireworks. But I knew right away, and I said to my boyfriend, I said, you know, somebody's shooting a gun. And I thought maybe so there was a huge crowd of people. I thought maybe, you know, some idiot in the crowd was showing off or being stupid. Um, and then, like, it just, like, carnage. And it was it was awful. It was something that I wish I could forget. I mean, but I still hear it. There are times when I feel like it was yesterday, you know. And How many shots do you think were fired before people actually realized that uh, something serious. I think those first three, because they weren't aimed at any people, but then as people started getting shot, um, I think the majority of the crowd realized, you know, people. And the crazy thing was, and why at the time, you know, the people that I was with, there were probably seven or eight people in my initial group that I hid with, and the reason we thought there were multiple shooters was, one, the sounds of the guns were very different. Um, and then where you could see people getting shot. You know, people were getting shot in different areas of the crowd. Um, and then there would be, like, a lull where there wouldn't be maybe, like, you know, 15 or 20 seconds where there wouldn't be any shooting, and then it would start back up again. And um, so I think there was a lot of concern and confusion as to what was going on. I think that was probably this, the – well, I mean, all of it was scary, but – not knowing, you know, what was going on or where it was coming from or, um, you know, what to do next. And I think, you know, at one point as I was laying there, and I was literally praying out loud, you know, and and I was thinking that it was an ISIS or like a, you know, like terrorist, a terrorist attack. Yeah, yeah because right. the whole theme of that, well, it's country music, so everybody's all about America and, you right. know. And they were always doing like tributes to the military and, um, and it wasn't uncommon to see somebody like wearing an American flag or the country artists were talking about America. And so I'm laying there thinking like, this is somebody that hates America. You know, this is, this is their way of like showing that they hate America. And, um, you know, I didn't know at the time were like bombs going to start going off. Like, were they going to start blowing up the strip? Like, what was, what was happening? Um, so now looking back and realizing now, okay, so they, he had, two rooms with two different angles and all those different guns and that's kind of makes more sense but at the time yeah i didn't i didn't think i would be here i definitely thought that uh when you actually when you actually did you know when you got how far did you run and where did, where did you hide you know i used to say that i don't even run even when being chased and that's not true like i ran like the wind i literally kicked my shoes off and i ran once we hid for um a long time it didn't i I'm, I was kind of like proud of myself because somebody would say, like, well, how long do you think you hid in that first area? And I was like, probably 15 or 20 minutes. And that's the initial shooting went from 10 p.m. to 10, 18 p.m. So it was 18 minutes um, where the gunshot, the gunshots, like I said, it stopped for maybe like 20 seconds, enough time for people to be like, okay, now what? And then all of a sudden it would start up again. So um, it's hard to describe, but the, the area that I was sitting in, and you know, I got a little bit, one person made a comment when I said I was sitting in the VIP section. It was $50 a day more to have this area, and there were, you know, 3,000 people in this area, but it had like a separate bathroom, and you know, I'm 46 years old, so back in the day, I was that girl in the front row with right. the throngs of people. We're not front row people. Right, you know, now I'm kind of like, eh, I don't want to be bumped, I don't want beer spilled on me. So I opted, you know, for the extra 200 bucks for the weekend. I was like, you know what? And that, it was called VIP. But again, if you see it, it's very loosely. I mean, it was like a, you know, metal trailer type of thing roped off. And, um, so that was the area that we were in. And, um, was that more, uh, accessible to where, as far as it was across the, the street was? from, it was, in fact, the pictures on my phone, like you can see, I was, sta- I was staying at Mandalay Bay too. Um, that's the hotel that I stayed at because it was right across the street from the venue. But, um, yeah, so I don't even remember what I was talking about. Now you got me all like, ugh. The VIP section? Yeah, so once we were able to, so we were hiding there for, you know, what seemed like a really long time, and I could still see everything going on, but we were hoping that if there were people, like, on foot shooting at us, like, they wouldn't maybe find us. Um, and then a SWAT team member broke our door down and, uh, you know, yelled for us to start running, and he actually, when they looked scared, that's yeah. scary, you know, and he yeah, right. said, 
Um, he said, just keep your heads down and run. And he's like, just run as fast as you can. And so, you know, but again, once we got there, you know, and then you just look around and it's just things that I never thought in my lifetime I would ever see or witness. And I've always had so much respect for the military and for the police. Um, but, you know, to know that you're going to go into a situation where you might get shot at is insane. So I don't know how, I don't know how they handle that or how they do that. So, um, Definitely something that, uh, you know, it will take me a long time, I think, to completely recover from. And I don't know that I'll ever, we talked about that before we came on air. Like, I don't know if it's something I'll ever get over. And I don't, I definitely feel like it's changed me. Um, like, you know, even being here, you know, I, I, I notice myself much more aware of who's walking in and out the door. I've already figured out how I would get out of here if I had to get out of here. Like, things you don't normally think about. Um, I gave up, I had some concert tickets and I've given those away or I just have no desire. I didn't go to, I usually try to hit one Steelers game a year. I just not even interested in doing that. So, you know, who knows, I guess just one day at a time and, uh, you know, maybe those, the, I don't know, like I said, it'll never go away and I still hear it. There's a lot of times we do the Otters games. I'm a big Otters fan and, uh, even sometimes there, you know, the crowd will start screaming and I'll have to just kind of like talk myself into like, you know, it's fine. They're having fun. Like nobody's getting hurt here and, but, yeah, it's crazy. It was did, insane. Did they offer you guys some type of counseling afterwards? They you... did, yeah. It was um, Route 91, the the company that puts that festival on. I mean, obviously, they were devastated, too. This certainly wasn't how they wanted to go down in history. Um, and I was really surprised. We had uh, a nice outreach from a group of counselors that were real involved with the 9-11 um, and helping people process that. Um, I have a lady here in Erie that I've used to help me in other issues in my past, and so she had reached out to me. So there was definitely a lot of help because this isn't something that you know how to handle. You know, it's not something that you, right. you know, ever expect to witness. Um, so there was a lot, and a lot of people I didn't even know, you know, reached out to me on Facebook and offered prayers, and which was super cool. I really appreciated that. But, uh yeah, I mean, I would have walked to Erie. Like, I was, I just wanted to get home. And I remember saying that over and over, like, 24 hours. I was like, I just want to get home. I just want to get home. And, you know, Vegas was basically shut down, you know, so there was no way to, to do anything. And we had to wait 24 hours to get back into Mandalay Bay. You would probably think it's like a 9-11 type of situation where, I mean, that's the way they had to play it. Yeah, well, they didn't know. And, and like I said, I have a girlfriend that's a, a nurse there in Vegas, and, uh, she said, like, you know, they started getting, like, reports about shooting and, you know, be prepared for patients. And she actually sent me a picture of her emergency room, and there was just blood everywhere, like, all over the floors, all over the walls. People just, I mean, I saw people being thrown into backs of pickup trucks that were just, you know, had been shot. And just, it was insane just to think, you know, you don't think you're ever going to see that or witness that. And I, I wish, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. You know, I, and I get kind of frustrated. I, I know people are doing those active prepared or active shooter preparedness classes. And, you know, I don't know how you could prepare for that. I mean, I guess knowing how to get out and things like that. But even here, like we're watching people walk in and out and like there, nobody's being metal detected or, and I hate to think that we live in that environment, but you know, we do. So. I mean, I know. you know, with school shootings. And yeah, places you think you're safe, you know, just yeah, I crazy. Mean, I mean, we're today's society, uh, nobody's safe anywhere. No, it's it's frightening, you know, and, and that uh, that we live in this environment. And I'm all about, another thing you and I talked about before we went on air, like I, I have guns. I mean, I carry, I have a permit to carry concealed. Um, I shoot in my backyard, kind of redneck. I live in the middle of the country, and we have a little shooting range in our backyard. So I'm all about protecting myself and, and the right to bear arms, but I truly believe our forefathers had no clue. We're thinking that anything like this could possibly happen, and nobody, after hearing machine guns being fired for, for 20 minutes, there isn't anyone that needs to own a machine gun besides the military. You know, I don't... I don't understand how that that's okay. I mean, they're only made for one purpose. I mean, you've hit the nail right on the head. I, I, when, the, when the founding fathers put that together, they were loading muskets. Yeah, they okay. weren't thinking of Stephen Paddock with 53 yeah. military-style guns in his room yeah. calculating how he was going to kill a group of people on the ground. You know, so I, I, you know, like I said, I'm all about carrying. I have my own gun. Um, I have, I actually have four of my own guns, and I'm not, a, I'm not against that at all. But I don't believe that my forefathers, when writing the Constitution, you know, would have been like, yeah, that's cool. Let that guy buy 53 guns in a year. You know, and again, they weren't. And as someone, 
because I've said this publicly, you know, I'm not afraid to speak my mind. And I had somebody message me on Facebook and say, like, well, you know, I have the right to own a machine gun if I want. Well, that's fine. Then you can't buy the ammunition. You know, if, you just, if you're a collector and you want to see one, that's cool. You know, then own it, but don't be able to shoot it. So, And then right afterwards in Texas was that church shooting. Same thing, military-style weapons yeah. and just in carnage. So... Um, and until you've experienced, I think that's another frustration when somebody says like, oh, well, I would have done this. You have no idea what you would have done. And if you'd have told me that I was going to run for two miles on I-75 in Las Vegas down the middle of the freaking highway, I'd have been like, hell no, I'm not going to run. Like, I don't run, you know. Um, I ran. Like, I ran, and I just, there was just no stopping me. It was about like 50 of us that, that we were hiding in a parking ramp. And um, and that's when I said, you know, if they're going to come and set off bombs, it's going to be where there's 50 of us or 300 of us, not I where mean, there's honestly, two of us if that would For a terrorist attack, that would be an ideal right. location. Right, and that, I've said that before. And um, so that's why I said, you know, they're not looking to kill me. They're looking to kill as many people as they can. And, again, this is when we thought it was terrorists. So that's what I said. We're, like, sitting down, I'm like, <laughs> counseling this 300 of us hiding in a parking ramp. And I'm like, we are sitting ducks. Like, yeah, we need to run. Absolutely. Like, we need to just get out of here. And uh, and so we did. I mean, we just we just all got up and started running, and it was crazy. Well, you know, you kind of talked about people not owning machine guns. And, you know, a lot of my friends, they're hunters, you know, and uh, I'm not much of a hunter myself. But, you know, I enjoy shooting. And, uh, you know, I think from what I hear from them, you know, they're under the premise that if the government, you know, starts uh, starts with machine guns, that... It's just going to keep progressing to where, you know, they lose all their guns, and it's you know I don't I don't understand that argument. I, I've you know that reminds me. One time I had somebody say to me, and I kid you not, we do we're big into spay neuter at the shelter. You know, big into animals not being able to reproduce. You know, and I had a lady say to me like, well, if you had your way, eventually there will be no more cats and dogs because none of them would reproduce. And I was like, really? Do you really think that that is the yeah. case? Like, come on. So it's the same thing with this. I mean, there has to be, and I don't know what it is. Like you said, I don't know everything, and I'm not proposing to even want to get involved in lobbying or anything like that. I just know that the way our community is and the way our society is, we need to do something. We need to do, you know, something to better protect each other, to better protect ourselves. Um, you know, I don't know. You know, just politically, you know, politically speaking, the gap between uh, the liberals and the conservatives just it just continues to to widen. Yeah, it's sad. You yeah. know, it's that whole uh, idea of just not being able to get along, and I don't. I see it on such a small local level. Um, you know, it scares me to think of you know a county or state or federal level, and yeah. just it just doesn't make any sense. But it's just finger pointing and blaming and. See why I stay in my little bubble? Like I just stay in like this little bubble the, and the I just Anna stay bubble. in this little bubble. Yeah, I don't. I mean, my dad was all about trying to change. Yeah. society and I'm not I just you know I want to just it's that whole bright in the corner where you are you know I want to lead by example and um, you know be true to myself and I don't know people either like it and want to uh, follow along or not so well I know that uh, you're you have uh, all these different programs so you you have you're focused on helping animals and yeah animals and people you yeah. know I like I said I like I grew up in a family that was very philanthropic. I mean, we always, we just talked about this Sunday night. My mom, 82 years old, wanted chicken wings. So I took her to Plymouth last night. It was so much fun. And, um, you know, she and I talked about how, you know, the number of, we had foster kids at our home, um, neighbors of ours that we barely knew, their house burned down. And my parents moved them in with us for three months. Like the crazy stuff. And I'm the youngest of seven. And my grandma lived with us. Like we always had this huge packed house. And, but my parents were all about, you know, helping others. And, you know, we're so blessed we need to help other people. And when I say we were blessed, I mean, my dad worked two jobs. Um, you know, he worked at Hammer Mill for 17 years, and he worked, you know, ran a flower shop with my mom. I mean, they were hard workers. We didn't have a lot, but I felt like we did. You know what I mean? Right. Looking back, and I, I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, my parents were poor. But, um, but man, they never made us feel that way. And so I think we just always gave back. And, uh, and so I think that's where I get a lot of it, and I'm so really blessed for good parenting. Well, you know, like I've told you before, you know, your father was the first guy to ever invite me on this show back when, when he was alive Very and cool. he was here. Yeah. I still feel his presence here, as weird as that sounds. Like, I, d I know he loved Erie, like, ridiculous. Like, the way I love animals, my dad loved the city. Like, 
crazy. And um, and he was so disappointed. I actually lived in Erie. My dad died when I was 38 years old, and I stayed living in Erie until he died. And then a few years later, I honestly moved because of other reasons, but um, I just felt like it would be such a slap in my dad's face if I left Erie because he loved Erie. There was just honestly had so much passion and so much heart for the city. So whether people agreed with him politically or not, you couldn't deny the fact that, you know, this this was his town and he right. was so proud of it. And uh, But, yeah, he was a good dude. I, I miss remember, him. I used to work at a local agency with, that worked with juvenile offenders, and that's when they were trying to introduce the curfew right. within the city. I remember that. So he had asked me to be part of the curfew oh, okay. committee. That was one of the first cool. city committees that I ever sat on. Nice. Five minutes, okay. And, uh, you know, ever then I ended up uh, starting a citywide shoveling program for seniors. Okay. And he ca- cool. he called me, he said, come on about that too, you know. And then, you know, he, every once in a while he'd say, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, it happened to him and then Cass took over. And right. So he, Cass calls, calls me a lot. That's to cool. come on the show and you know those guys you know they kept the show going um you know when i was younger i would watch it too so uh, i don't mind doing it and no uh, that's nice i think that's nice for the citizens to have a way to be heard if they need to talk and not everybody can make it to council meetings so it's a good avenue for people to get a hold of you well you only get a few callers you know you get a lot of the same people that call well and not to be Offensive, but I mean, a lot of people are working right now. I was just too. about to say. So it's a tough time. So maybe people can watch it, right. you know, in the replay. That's, um, that's when you know. most of them Or you could do like, you know what? Here's an idea for you. You could do like an email in your question and then you could read it back. Oh, that's an uh, idea uh, for later. Uh, hey, listen, two weeks ago, they didn't even have the, I came and sat oh. down. They didn't even have the phone set up. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe they could give out an email address underneath there and just it, say like, it, if you can't actually, call in during I kinda two like to the, three. Uh, Mike, Mike. I know you're back there. Email. Add that in there. Add an email. But we got to teach Kaz how to use a... Well, that's the he thing. Knows that email. Somebody would have to print them out, and then he could just read them oh. so people could get their well, questions see, answered. Kaz has... He's finally got a smartphone now. Oh, no. So he's kind of... Well, my of, dad passed away, so I actually still have his flip phone. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, he would never... But Kaz ever. had a flip phone to like, about uh, six months ago. Oh, yeah. Well, here's a cool, quick, cool story. So my car got broken into in Columbus. That wasn't the cool part. And my purse was stolen, and this was the year after my dad died. And I was more upset because my dad's cell phone was in there, my dad's wallet, things that I kept close to me because it reminded me of my dad. And so I was so angry about that. I didn't care about my money or anything that was stolen. I was so upset about those two things. Seven months later, I got a phone call from the state police in Ohio, and he said, you know, you lost an orange purse, and I'll never forget because I'm about orange purse, how ugly. And he said, we found an orange purse on the side of the road, and he said, it might be yours the next time you're in Columbus. So I, I literally, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go. And he said, there's some things in it. And my dad's cell phone and his wallet were still in that purse. So I was really thankful to get those two things back, that crook that stole everything else, but left uh, some important well, things you know, that honestly, were irreplaceable. I, I was just going to say. And his flip phone. So my dad's old, creepy flip phone, um, I, I got that back and his wallet. So it's pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, so good, good memories. Well, you know, the, the money is not the important part. No, I was pretty angry, though. I was at a Wendy's for 11 minutes. I went in with my daughter to get some food. We come back out, and both the driver's side and passenger side front windows were smashed out. Where was this at? Columbus. Just outside of Columbus. Nothing bad about Columbus. Great town. Police were awesome. Um, but I couldn't believe it, and it was like 730 at night, and nobody saw anything, and it was right on the side of the thruway. So, yeah, so they stole my purse and my cell phone. But anyway, got some yeah, of I remember your, your father was... Uh very uh, in, in encouraging the casino coming into the city. At yeah, the, the, the casino and the otters were two of his yeah. prize uh, things that he really worked hard to get here. And I think uh, the otters have always been close to my heart because I remember him traveling up to Canada and trying to woo this team to Erie. So I, I remember him being very proud when they chose Erie. And then the casino, even though the location wasn't the one that he wanted or thought was most beneficial for the city, I'm thankful that they at least came to Erie County. So uh, I know the gaming revenue certainly helps uh, the county out a lot. Yeah, the, it does help the county out a lot, and but uh, the city, I don't know. Well, you know. If, we, if it would have been in a city, it would have been a lot different. A lot different, yeah. The whole east side would have been, been a lot different. I think it would have been a lot different, yeah. But, you know. I mean, uh, hindsight is 50 or 20-20. One minute, Mike. Mike, uh, 
Go buy a laptop for Kaz. Ruth wants email. <laughs> I know. Well, right. you, you all have to have city email. They do. They do. That, that's what I'm saying. That's they, what I'm saying. They could just put Kaz's email up there and yeah. just say, email Kaz your question, and he'll read it. So if you're working and you can't, and then you can rewatch. Don't they air this a bunch of times? Yeah, they are. Yeah, see? I'm like, solving your problem. Yeah, actually, I kind of <laughs> like the idea. Now we got to get Kaz to, uh, maybe if I come on, we'll give him an email. And yeah. then I, we can all pull out my phone or we can put a laptop right there. But I do kind of like that. I yeah, it can be, you know, because you get home at night and you're watching this and you're like, oh, I have a yeah. question. Actually, I kind of like, they were talking about taking it to a uh, cat TV, another station that. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm familiar, familiar with, with that. that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've done some stuff there. They've had us on there for the shelter. Well, listen, thanks for, before we go. Yes. Uh, tell us, you know, anybody that wants to donate, give us a quick reminder of the yeah, website and how to donate. It's theannashelter.com. So if you just Google Anna Shelter, it'll pull up, but it's T-H-E-A-N-N-A-S-H-E-L-T-E-R.com um, or on our Facebook page uh, or stop by. We love visitors. Okay, and if you want to volunteer or donate, uh, hit the website or their Facebook page, and uh, Ruth will take care of you. Thanks, Ruth. Mike, hit that music. Hit that old school music. Let's hear it. There it is. There you go. (laughs) Green Zone Government Access, Channel 9.